These are the answers to the Chemistry 2007 SOL test. Number one, what is the volume of the liquid in the graduated cylinder? Well, if we label these lines, we have 10 milliliters, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can see that the bottom of the meniscus, which is where we're supposed to read the liquid level, is halfway between 13 milliliters and 14 milliliters. So therefore, the correct answer is B, 13.5 milliliters. Number two, atoms of the noble gases are generally inert. Now the word inert means non-reactive. So this question is asking, why are the noble gases not going to react with any other elements? And the answer is because of valence electrons. If, for example, you're an alkali metal in group one, like lithium or sodium, then you would tend to lose one valence electron when you react to form a positive ion. If, for example, you are a halogen in group 17 and you have seven valence electrons, like fluorine or chlorine, then you tend to gain one electron. Either way, losing or gaining electrons, you're trying to fill out your outer shell with a complete set of valence electrons. So which elements already have a complete set of valence electrons? the noble gases. So therefore, the reason why they are inert or unreactive is because their outer electron levels are filled. Number three, what is the mass of a mole of calcium hydroxide? So the formula for calcium hydroxide is Ca parentheses OH2. That means we have one calcium, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. They were nice enough in this problem to tell us the molar mass, the atomic mass of calcium hydrogen and oxygen, we could just find that information on the periodic table. So calcium has a molar mass of 40. There are two hydrogens, so two times one, and there are two oxygens, so two times 16. We add all these up, 40 plus two plus 32, 74 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of calcium hydroxide. In number four, we have four different chemical reactions. The first one, happens to be a double replacement because the two partners are switching. So we have two compounds and we form two new compounds. The second one happens to be a single replacement. So element plus compound to produce new element and new compound. The last one, you start with a compound that breaks down into smaller, simpler compounds. That's decomposition. What's the opposite of a decomposition? That's when you form one compound from either smaller substances or from elements. So because letter C forms one compound, it is a synthesis. That's the correct answer. In number five, we're talking about valence electrons again. This particular atom of sulfur has six dots around it. That's because it's located in group 16 and has six valence electrons. So does oxygen, selenium, tellurium, they all have six valence electrons. So the correct answer, which of the elements has the same Lewis dot structure? Oxygen, because it also has six valence electrons. In number six, this is really more of a math question than a chemistry question. We have two gases in a mixture, 60% nitrogen and 40% oxygen. So we're focusing on the oxygen 40% of the mixture is oxygen, so what is 40% of 800? So 0.4 times 800 is 320, so that is the partial pressure of oxygen. Correct answer is B. Here we have a balanced equation for the combustion of butane, C4H10, and we are trying to figure out how many moles of water can be produced. So we start with 12.5 moles of butane, and we're going to be converting that into moles of water. This is a one-step conversion. This does not involve the periodic table. This involves the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. So we put moles of butane on the bottom, and we put moles of water on the top. So filling in the numbers for the coefficients, we have 10 moles of water that are produced for every two moles of butane consumed. 12.5 times 10 divided by two gives us the correct answer, 62.5 moles of water. 
In number eight, before we can write the formula of magnesium chloride, we should know the difference between magnesium, which is Mg, and manganese, which is Mn. So we know that the correct answer is either A or C. Now, based on the location of magnesium on the periodic table, which is in group two, it's an alkaline earth metal, it has a plus two charge, and chlorine, which is a halogen in group 17, has a minus one charge. Now that we know that magnesium is plus two and chloride is minus one, all we have to use is what I call the crisscross rule. So the two now goes as a subscript outside the chlorine, and then the chlorine, which has a minus one charge, that one is understood to be there. Correct answer is A, MgCl2. Number nine, we're talking about protons neutrons and electrons. Now the isotope of titanium happens to have a mass of 50. Let's find titanium on the periodic table. The symbol for titanium is Ti. It has 22 protons. So we know the correct answer is either A or D. If the mass number is 50, the mass number, which is equal to protons plus neutrons, 22 plus what number? equals 50. Well, 50 minus 22 is 28. So we have 22 protons and we have 28 neutrons. So the correct answer is D. Number 10. This is talking about vaporization. Now vaporization is a word that just means going from a liquid to a gas. And we can see in the table that water, H2O, has a higher molar heat of vaporization than ammonia, NH3. Here we're looking at what's called a heating curve. It's a bunch of lines and you can see some diagonal lines that are slanted upward and then you can see some flat lines. So line segment BC, that's where melting occurs. That's a phase change. Line segment DE, that's where vaporization occurs. That's also a phase change, so liquid to gas. Now it says in this paragraph, we are converting from one phase to another at constant temperature. The temperature remains constant during these phase changes because added energy is used to overcome the attractive forces between molecules. The attractive forces between molecules are called intermolecular forces. So therefore, if we're comparing these two substances and we wanna know why one of them requires more heat to go from a liquid to a gas, it's because that substance, water, has stronger intermolecular attractive forces. So the correct answer is A. Number 11, if we go to absolute zero, that's very, very cold, what happens to the molecules of a solid? Well, in general, as molecules get colder, they start to slow down, their speed decreases. As you approach absolute zero, Molecules move even more slowly, and they don't even vibrate anymore. They just stop moving. So their motion gradually decreases and eventually would just stop. Number 12 is a unit conversion. We're starting with 10 milliliters, and we have to convert from milliliters to mass. So mass is in grams. We want milliliters on the bottom and grams on top. We also want to know that there are 7.87 grams for every one milliliter based on the density. So the problem with choice B is that it has 7.87 milliliters is equal to one gram. That's backwards. The problem with choice D is the same thing. It has 7.87 milliliters and then one gram. And the problem with choice C is that the units of milliliters are not going to cancel out because they're not on opposite sides. So the correct answer is A, one milliliter on the bottom, 7.87 grams on top. That way the units will cancel out properly and you'll get the correct answer. In number 13, we are not going from moles to moles like we did earlier, that was one step. This time we're going from grams to grams. That's a three-step conversion. This involves the periodic table in the first step to go from grams to moles. Then we use the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation to go from moles of one chemical to another. 
And then we use the periodic table to go from moles back to grams. So to start this off, one mole of O2 has a molar mass of 32 because the periodic table says that each O has a mass of 16. So O2 is 32. For the second step, we put two on the top. So two moles of nitrogen are consumed for every five moles of oxygen that are consumed. And those numbers, two and five, come from the coefficients. Finally, the periodic table says that nitrogen weighs 14, but this is N2. So 14 times two is 28. The whole process, three steps, involves the following math. 16 divided by 32 times two divided by five times 28. So our answer is 5.6 grams of nitrogen. Number 14 shows us a balanced chemical equation for the formation of HCl. Hydrogen chloride can be formed from hydrogen, H2, and chlorine, Cl2. Now chlorine and fluorine are in the same group. They're both halogens. If the reaction were performed with fluorine instead of chlorine, how many moles of H2 would be required to balance the equation? So currently, the equation as it stands involves one mole of hydrogen, it reacts with one mole of chlorine, and it produces two moles of HCl. Remember that fluorine and chlorine are in the same family, so they should react in similar ways. Let's take this equation and just substitute fluorine for chlorine. So it looks exactly the same, except that now we have H2 plus F2, and we produce two moles of HF. The question said, how many moles of H2 would be required to balance the equation? It's still the same number as it was before, which is one. In number 15, we're given a chemical formula and we have to come up with the proper name. Now I taught you the polyatomic ion song. You can see there are eight polyatomic ions, hydroxide, chlorate, nitrate. Well, phosphate is PO4. So if phosphate is PO4, covalent compounds, which are typically two nonmetals, they have prefixes in their name like carbon dioxide, or dinitrogen trioxide. Is this particular material that involves magnesium and phosphate, is it covalent or is it ionic? Well, there's a metal and there are some nonmetals, so it is ionic. Ionic compounds do not have prefixes in their names. So we know it's magnesium, we know it's phosphate, and that's it. The Roman numeral three, that would be the charge on the magnesium, which is not used, that's incorrect. We do use, we use Roman numerals, but only for transition metals in the middle of the periodic table. So therefore, correct answer is just simple, magnesium phosphate, that's it. In number 16, we have the symbol for radium, Ra. The mass is 220, and the atomic number is 88. Now the atomic number is the number of protons. So radium has 88 protons, and that is the correct answer. Number 17 involves accuracy and precision. Let's remind ourselves the difference between accuracy and precision. Well, precision is how close a set of measurements are to each other. And accuracy is how close a measurement is to the accepted value. Sometimes you can be precise. For example, in student one's data, those numbers are pretty precise. They're pretty close to each other, but they're not accurate because the actual temperature was 80 degrees. We're looking for a set of data that has numbers that are close to each other and pretty close to 80. So the correct answer is D, student four. Number 18, talking about how particles move. And here's a good picture. We have a container of gas and pressure inside the container comes from collisions of gas molecules with the container walls. Now these particles are traveling in straight lines and when they collide with each other or with the container walls, they just bounce off and they just keep moving. They just keep bouncing and bouncing and bouncing forever. Unless we change the temperature, they don't speed up and they don't slow down. They don't travel in curved lines of motion. They are pretty far apart. Gases are very 
low in terms of their density compared to liquids and solids, so the particles are very far apart, and they don't have any attractive forces between them. So the correct answer is they undergo elastic collisions. That just means that when they bounce off each other, they keep moving. They don't lose any energy in the process. Number 19. We can look on the periodic table and we can find beryllium and oxygen. We're focusing on the mass. So beryllium has a mass of around 9 and oxygen has a mass of 16. So 9 plus 16 is 25. Correct answer is D. Number 20 has to do with what a catalyst does. A catalyst speeds up a reaction. So how does a catalyst make a reaction go faster? In this diagram you can see a red line showing the path from the reactants to the products. That's called the uncatalyzed reaction. And then you see a blue line that starts at the same level and finishes at the same level, but we changed the pathway. This has a lower pathway. That's the catalyzed reaction. So to get over this energy barrier, to get over this little hill from reactants to products, we call this area of this energy diagram the activation energy. So as you can see, the catalyzed reaction has a lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed. So what does a catalyst do? A catalyst lowers the activation energy. So the correct answer is D. All right, this question has to do with chloride. That's the negative one charge on a chlorine atom. This is a chloride ion. So chlorine, the atom, has 17 protons and 17 electrons. Chloride, the ion, has a negative one charge. So when you have a negative one charge, you've changed your number of electrons. So a chloride ion still has 17 protons, it's still chlorine, but now it has 18 electrons. This question says, has the same number of electrons as a neutral atom of? And the answer is argon. Argon would have 18 protons and 18 electrons. In number 22, when you measure the temperature, especially if there happens to be a hot plate underneath this beaker, you don't want to put the thermometer all the way on the bottom because you might be touching the hot plate. And obviously in choice C, the thermometer is not even in the liquid. So the best way to record the temperature of the water is to measure the center area of the liquid. So the correct answer is choice D. Number 23. You don't have to memorize these electronegativity values, but you should know the general trend in electronegativity, as in how does it change when you go across a period from left to right, and how does it change when you go down a group from top to bottom. Well, here is the trend. Take a look at these numbers, and you can see that in general, electronegativity values tend to increase from left to right across a period, and these values tend to decrease from top to bottom down a group. So if that's the trend for the question mark where chlorine is, what value should that have? It should be somewhere between 2.8 and 4.0 based on that vertical trend. So the correct answer is C, 3.0. In number 24, we've already talked about how two nonmetals tend to form a covalent bond whereas a metal and a nonmetal tend to form a ionic bond. Let's find these elements on the periodic table. Calcium, iodine, potassium, bromine, sodium, chlorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. Let's see if they are metals or nonmetals. So a metal plus a nonmetal is an ionic bond. Two nonmetals is a covalent bond. Well, I'm looking for two nonmetals. I see calcium, that's a metal, and iodine is a nonmetal. I see potassium and bromine, there's one of each, metal and nonmetal. And I see sodium and chlorine, again, metal, nonmetal. So the correct answer is going to be D because both nitrogen and oxygen are nonmetals. All right, in this question, We've already gone from moles to moles and grams to grams. What are we doing here? 
We're starting with 5 moles of C3H8, and we have to get to molecules of water. Now, molecules involves Avogadro's number. 1 mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Those could be atoms or molecules. So in this case, I know I have to use Avogadro's number, but I also have to convert from C3H8 into water. This will be a two-step conversion. First, we're going to go from moles of C3H8 to moles of water, and we're going to use the coefficients and the balanced equation for that. Then we're going to use Avogadro's number to go from moles to molecules. So there are four moles of water for every one mole of C3H8. That's a four to one ratio. Then we have Avogadro's number next to molecules and one mole on the bottom. So the math we're doing is the following. Five times four and then times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And when we do that, on our calculator, we get 1.2 times 10 to the 25th. The correct answer is C. In number 26, we should know the name sublimation. It's an example of a phase change. So here are the six types of phase changes you could have. Solid to liquid, melting. The opposite of that is freezing. Liquid to gas, evaporation or boiling. The opposite of that is condensation. Solid to gas, sublimation. The opposite of that is deposition. So if we're going from a solid to a gas, the correct answer is B. Number 27, two nonmetals. What type of bond are they going to have? Well, they're going to have a covalent bond. So two nonmetals, covalent, metal and nonmetal, ionic. Number 28, we've already talked about this before. The role of a catalyst, so here's that diagram again. A catalyst lowers the activation energy, so the correct answer is C. In number 29, nitrogen monoxide is being compared with nitrogen dioxide. Well, the formula of nitrogen monoxide is just NO, and the formula of nitrogen dioxide is NO2. So the difference is that nitrogen monoxide has one fewer atom of oxygen. Number 30 is a lab safety question. Sulfuric acid has been spilled on the laboratory bench. Which chemical would be useful for neutralizing the acid? Here we see pictures of baking soda and vinegar. Now it turns out that baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, that's the name, and the chemical formula is NaHCO3. When you mix baking soda with vinegar or any acid, the H plus from the acid combines with the ion HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate, and you get water and you get carbon dioxide. That's why you get bubbles when you add vinegar and baking soda. Now this neutralizes the acid, so therefore the correct answer is D, which happens to be baking soda. It neutralizes the acid. Number 31, we're talking about two different isotopes of sulfur. Now remember the mass number is protons plus neutrons. So if I have sulfur with a mass of 32, 16 is the atomic number of sulfur. So I have 16 protons and I have 16 neutrons. If I have sulfur, 34, I still have 16 protons, but now I have 18 neutrons. So when compared to sulfur 32, sulfur 34 has more neutrons. Number 32, there is a set of data points, but they're not all exactly in a line. The relationship was expected to be linear. So if I draw a straight line through these points, it looks like there was an error with data point two. So that's the one that doesn't seem to fit with all the others. In number 33, we are given a compound and we have to come up with the name. Now these elements, phosphorus and nitrogen, are nonmetals. So they are on the right side of the periodic table. Phosphorus and nitrogen are nonmetals, so the type of bonding is covalent. For covalent molecules, when we name them, we use prefixes 
So in this case, we have prefixes like tri and penta for three and five. And the second word in the compound should always end with I-D-E. So three is tri, so triphosphorus, and then five is penta, pentanitride. Now in number 34, it talks about the word oxidation state. Sometimes the word oxidation state just means the charge on the particular element as it becomes an ion. So for example, if magnesium becomes plus two, then the charge is plus two, or the oxidation state is plus two. But this is a little different. What makes it different is that we have three elements. The total charge on this compound is zero. And we are given the oxidation state of two of the three elements. We're given the oxidation state of hydrogen is plus one, and we're given the oxidation state of oxygen is negative two. Now we have three of them, so three times negative two is negative six. Now this becomes a math question. If the total charge is zero, and I already have plus one and minus six, what should the charge on nitrogen be? What should the oxidation state of nitrogen be so that when these numbers are added together, we get zero? Well, the correct answer is that nitrogen has an oxidation state of plus five. Here we have a phase diagram, and on the left, in that region, that's a solid. In the middle, between the curved lines, that's a liquid, and on the far right, that's a gas. So at what point do solid, liquid, and gas phases coexist simultaneously? That would be at point one. We call that the triple point. Number 36 is basically a math question. We should know that the total pressure of all of these gases added together is equal to the sum of the individual partial pressures of each gas. And we don't know the partial pressure of CO2. But we know the total pressure of all of them added together is 760. Let's add up the pressures that we have in the table. And if we add those up, we get 759.76 millimeters of mercury. Since the total pressure is 760, let's subtract what we know. So 759.76 is subtracted from 760. And that gives us the partial pressure of CO2, which is B, 0.24 millimeters of mercury. Question 37 is a lab safety question. Wearing long hair down is a safety hazard because your hair might catch on fire depending on how you're heating something. If there's a Bunsen burner involved, you want to pull your hair back. Having goggles, they should not be within reach. They should be worn covering your eyes, not your forehead. Keeping the test tube securely stoppered would be a problem if you're heating a test tube because it might build up pressure and possibly explode. Letter C says pointing the test tube away from people. So you don't want to have the test tube pointed toward you or anyone else. You want to have the test tube pointing away from anyone in case it splashes or bubbles. Correct answer is C. Number 38, this is a single replacement reaction. We have element plus compound producing a new element and a compound. Our job is to balance the equation. So let's start with the Al, the aluminum. Let's put a two on the left to balance the aluminum. Now the SO4 on the right has parentheses around it with a three. That multiplies by three. So how do we get three SO4s on the left? We'll use a coefficient to balance the SO4. Now we have three times two, six hydrogens on the left. Let's put a three on the right. The equation is balanced. The coefficient for H2SO4 is three. Number 39, what is the relationship between temperature and volume as described in Charles' Law? Now, temperature and volume, think about this. If you heat a gas, the volume increases. So for example, a balloon, when it gets hotter, it's going to expand. That is a direct relationship. We're looking for a straight line. Not a straight line going down, but a straight line going up. 
So a direct relationship between temperature and volume means that the correct answer is A. In number 40, we have three different models of the atom, and we have to place them in order. So of those three models, which one sounds the most primitive or simple? Well, that's going to be the solid sphere model, as if there is no information at all about protons, electrons, and neutrons. That the atom is just a solid sphere, like a marble. Next comes the planetary model, where we do know that there's a nucleus and that the electrons would be in different energy levels. The electrons orbiting the nucleus like planets revolving around the sun. A more sophisticated model is that the electrons are not in these energy levels that are just traveling little orbits, but that the electron is in a cloud that we call an orbital a region in space where we have a probability of finding an electron. That's the quantum mechanical model. So therefore, solid sphere came first, quantum mechanical came last. Correct answer is D. Number 41, we have to know how to go from Celsius to Kelvin. To go from Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273. So 78 plus 273 the answer is 351 Kelvin. For number 42, we have to classify this reaction into one of these particular types. Is it a single replacement, element plus compound, to make new element and new compound? Is it a double replacement, where we have two compounds and they switch partners? It is, is it a synthesis, where you form one compound? Or is it a decomposition, where you break down one compound. Well, there is only one chemical formula, H2CO3 on the right. This is a synthesis. Number 43, what is pH measure? Well, in this information from one of my textbooks, pH has to do with the molar concentration of H+. So we express the concentration of H+, in terms of pH. It is the negative logarithm in base 10 of the concentration of H+. Plus. So the hydrogen ion concentration, that's what pH measures. By the way, the hydroxide ion concentration is also measured with P, but not pH. It's called pOH. And pH plus pOH is always equal to 14. All right, number 44. We have a synthesis equation, but we're missing a number on the right. So we have 5 times 2. We have 10 oxygens on the left, so we should have 10 oxygens on the right, but the x represents a number. 2 times 5 would give us 10 oxygens, so x equals 5. The name of that compound would be diphosphorus pentoxide. All right, 45, we're just putting a number in scientific notation. The first part of the number must fall between 1 and 10. So place the decimal here between the 5 and the 6. We have 5.65. And now we have to move the decimal over 11 places to the right. 5.65 times 10 to the 11 is the correct answer. Number 46. We know that there is ionic bonds and there is covalent bonds. No matter what type of bond, electrons are being shared or electrons are being transferred but there's definitely electrons involved in chemical bonds. Number 47 involves molarity. So when you see capital M, that's moles of solute over liters of solution. In this case, we don't have to convert from grams to moles or milliliters to liters. They've given us the moles, so 0.81, and they've given us the liters, 0.67. All we have to do is divide one by the other, 0.81, divided by 0.67 gives us the correct answer, 1.2 moles per liter. Number 48 involves the formula for percent error. The formula for percent error is that you take the difference between the measurements, that's the absolute value of that difference, you divide by the true value or the accepted value, and then you multiply by 100. So the difference between the measurements would be 107.5 minus 105.2, divide that by the true value, which is 107.5, and then multiply by 100. 
And if we do this math, we get 2.1% error. Number 49, this is an ionic compound involving a metal and a nonmetal. Aluminum has a charge of plus 3. Chloride has a charge of minus 1. So when we use the crisscross rule, we get AlCl3. Correct answer is A. Number 50 deals with equilibrium. Here's some information about equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium occurs when two opposing reactions proceed at equal rates. When equilibrium is achieved, the concentrations of reactants and products no longer change over time. So one clue that you have equilibrium is you'll see double arrows in a chemical reaction. Now the diagram on the left shows that the concentration of these reactants and products were changing, but then once they cross that dashed line, at that point, they stay constant. So the concentrations are staying constant over time. That's equilibrium. In the diagram on the right, the reaction rate at some point either decreases or increases, but when they become the same, when those two rates become equal, equilibrium has been achieved. So the correct answer is C. The rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. Okay, this is the end of the Chemistry 2007 SOL test. I hope that those answers and explanations were helpful. Thanks for watching.